Would you like to know more? An Explanation of the Michelson-Gale Experiment by Malcolm Bowden. In 1925, Michelson and Gale set up an experiment to see if they could detect the rotation of the Earth on its regular one revolution per day. They set up a very large rectangle of 12-inch diameter tubes in a field with a light source and mirrors at the corners. The light travelled in opposite directions around the rectangle and when recombined gave fringe movements which were only 2.6% different from what they expected would be the result of one revolution per day. The very much shorter calibration tube circuit was too small to register any speed difference between the north and south arms. These fringes were used as a basis for the fringe changes when the light went round the full circuit. How did it work? In this diagram, I have exaggerated the size of the rectangle of the Michelson Gale tubes to make it clear how it worked. The equator travels approximately 25,000 miles in one day's rotation. You can see that this speed decreases as the latitude increases. At 15 degrees of latitude, the circumference of that latitude is slightly smaller so it only travels 24,150 miles in each day. The distance travelled per day reduces as the latitude increases until it is zero at the North Pole. Imagine their tube south arm being at the equator and the north arm on the 30 degrees latitude. The light going round the tubes in both directions would experience a higher velocity of the ether going through the south tube at the equator than when travelling through the northern tube at the 30 degree latitude. When they were recombined, they would produce a different fringe interference pattern when compared with the very much shorter path using the calibration circuit. Although their rectangle was far smaller than this, it was sufficiently large to detect the difference with surprising accuracy. From 269 observations, they obtained an average change of 0.230 fringe. This was only 2.6% different to the calculated change expected of 0.236 fringe. Thus, within experimental accuracy, the ether was passing across the face of the Earth at the predicted one revolution per day. In their report, there is no mention of any conclusions they draw. They simply state the result. Here, surely we can conclude that there is an ether and either one the Earth is rotating one revolution per day, or two, the ether is rotating around us one revolution per day. That it was item two that was correct had already been demonstrated by Airy in 1871. As we have shown in a separate YouTube video given here below, his results showed that it was the ether rotating around the stationary Earth. This was a disastrous result for the establishment scientists, who could not possibly allow any evidence that the Earth was in a special position in the universe to have any scientific support whatsoever. So Airy had to completely fudge his report to say his results merely refuted a proposal by Professor Klingerfuse. 
So here we now have the MG experiment proving that there was an ether and that it was moving across the surface of the Earth one rotation per day. How does the present day establishment scientists deal with the awkward results of the Michelson-Gale experiment? They adopt their usual tactics of lying and obfuscation. I use the phrase relativity gobbledygook. The first thing they do is that whatever the obvious interpretation of the results might be, they immediately boldly claim that they confirm relativity theory. They then proceed to muddy the waters by speaking about inertial frames of reference and entering into complex explanations of how the experiment fully confirms relativity. As an example, I give here the entry in Wikipedia for this experiment, and their confusion is obvious. It is a classic example of pure obfuscation and trying to bypass the most obvious conclusion of the results. Just listen to the weasel words they have to use. It should be noted that Michelson remained a believer in the existence of the ether to the end of his life. A quote from Wikipedia on the Michelson-Gale experiment. As it was already pointed out by Michelson in 1904, a positive result in such experiments contradicts the hypothesis of complete ether drag. On the other hand, the stationary ether concept is in agreement with this result, yet it contradicts, with the exception of Lorentz's ether, the Michelson-Morley experiment. Thus, special relativity is the only theory which explains both experiments. Emphasis MB. Does it really? Here is the bold claim. They do not bother to provide any explanation or evidence whatsoever. The experiment is consistent with relativity for the same reason as all other Sagnac type experiments, see Sagnac effect. That is, rotation is absolute in special relativity because there is no inertial frame of reference in which the whole device is at rest during the complete process of rotation. Emphasis MB. This is pure relativity gobbledygook used to wriggle out of clear evidence. Thus the light paths of the two rays are different in all of those frames. Consequently a positive result must occur. It is also possible to define rotating frames in special relativity by the Born coordinates. Yet in those frames, the speed of light is not constant in extended areas anymore. Thus also, in this view, a positive result must occur. Today, Sagnac type effects due to Earth's rotation are routinely incorporated into GPS. That's the end of the Wikipedia quote. This is another half lie. They have claimed that Sagnac is explained by relativity and that GPS corrections are the results of relativity. These GPS corrections are really classic corrections including Sagnac and are nothing to do with relativity. This claim is regularly made by relativists. There are a number of sites on the internet debunking the many false claims of relativity. One of the best dealing with GPS satellites and many other problems with the theory that contends they are not affected by relativity can be seen at the following link. Finally, to get rid of the Michelson-Morley failure to detect the 30 kilometers per second speed of the Earth around the Sun, Einstein just abolished the ether in his relativity theory. Yet here, we have again clear evidence of the existence of the ether. There is no mention of this 
awkward fact in this review. Orthodox relativity scientists are all guilty of willful blindness. Malcolm Bowden, 5th of April, 2017. If a telescope is pointing at a star, and both are stationary, then obviously the light comes straight into the telescope. In 1729, Bradley found that he had to tip his telescope forward very slightly to get a star in the center of his telescope. It was assumed that this was due to the motion of the Earth around the Sun. Let us assume that the telescope was moving at 5 mile an hour and had to be tipped 5 degrees. This 5 degree tipping, however, could equally be caused by the ether moving at 5 mile an hour carrying the stars around the Earth. As we see here, the light would be coming in at the same angle and the telescope would still have to be tipped 5 degrees. So tipping the telescope does not tell us whether it is the starlight moving or the telescope moving. However, there is a simple experiment that can determine whether it was the Earth that was moving or the ether and starlight. All that you had to do was record the tipping required for any particular star, then fill the telescope with water, which greatly slows down the speed of light in the telescope. So here is the moving telescope filled with water, tipped at 5 degrees, and you can see that the starlight does not now reach the eyepiece at the bottom. This is because the starlight moves much more slowly when passing through water. However, if the telescope is tipped further, say 10 degrees, then the starlight will then be visible again in the eyepiece. It has to be tipped further because the light is now slower when in the telescope. But if the starlight is going past the telescope at 5 mile an hour, then when it is filled with water, no further tipping is needed because the light is coming in at 5 degrees anyway. The starlight stays on the same path but is only travelling slower in the water. To recap, if it is the telescope that is moving, then when it is filled with water, it has to be tipped further to see the star. If the telescope is stationary and the starlight drifting past us, then it does not have to be tipped further. In 1871, George Biddle Airy, the Astronomer Royal, performed this experiment. This is a copy from his original report. You can see that the two readings are virtually identical. If it had been the telescope that was moving, Airy expected a figure of 30 seconds of arc. In fact, he only managed to read 0.8 seconds of arc difference. Bradley first discovered stellar aberration, and it is interesting that in his report, Airy mentions that it was now about 100 seconds of arc, and that it was still slowly diminishing. This indicates that the speed of light was still decreasing in measurable amounts when Airy performed his experiment 
in 1871. The result of Aries' experiment, known as Aries' failure, was that the telescope does not have to be tipped further. This proved that it was the incoming light that was moving past a stationary telescope fixed to the stationary Earth. What is interesting in his very brief report of only four pages is that not once did he refer to the astonishing results that the experiment proved that the Earth was stationary. This experiment was also dismissed by Wikipedia, which said, Ether drag test, under the main article, Luminiferous Ether. By means of a water-filled telescope, Airy, in 1871, looked for a change in stellar aberration through the refracting water due to an ether drag. Like in all other ether drift experiments, he obtained a negative result. This is a gross distortion of the truth. That he did not have to change the angle proved that it was the ether drifting past the stationary surface of the Earth. This experiment is never taught to university science students. They might begin to question what they were being taught about the cosmos, the universe, the Big Bang, evolution and much else if it was realized that the Earth really is at the center of the universe, which is rotating around us, as the Bible always clearly states.